Hey y'all, I'm Kelly Moody and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast, an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling with farmers, herbalists, craftspeople, naturalists, artists, and more. Hey y'all, it's Kelly here, and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast. I'm currently recording this from my hometown of South Hill, Virginia, where I'm visiting my family and eating pawpaws, which are in season right now. This episode of the podcast features a conversation with Lisa Schoenberg, who is based out of Portland, Oregon, and Lisa is a composer, percussionist, field recordist, teacher, and writer with a background in entomology and ecology. Lisa is a Signal Fire alumni, and we've been in touch pretty much all summer about trying to do an interview together, and we managed to meet up in person while I was in Portland this past August. Lisa has traveled extensively to carry out fieldwork and perform her land and form music, and she earned her Master's in Environmental Studies at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, with a focus on ant biodiversity in the neotropics. Lisa documents soundscapes, insects, and habitat through music composition, writing, and multimedia collaboration. She strives to draw attention to endangered species, habitat loss, and other environmental issues through a merging of artistic and scientific practices, often in collaboration with other ecologists. In this episode of the podcast, we talk about Lisa's ADA fieldwork, and ADA stands for Amplifying the Tropical Ants a project in collaboration with Brazilian etymologists investigating ant bioacoustics in the Amazon. Lisa is very interested in the ecological and cultural relevance of sons escondidos, or hidden sounds, and how they can impact our perception of non-human species and our decision-making processes. Lisa and I talk about the importance of the field of acoustic ecology in combining music composition and ecological field research, We talk about how Lisa performs her place-based compositions with her ensemble Secret Drum Band and WOW. We discuss the Hylaeus Project and Lisa's study of endemic and endangered bees in Hawaii. That research was super fascinating to me, and before I went to Hawaii this past spring, I had a different awareness about the bees there, knowing a bit about this project before I went, and it was really sweet to hear Lisa expand on that. And we also talk about the importance of citizen science in Hawaii, how research on the bees in Hawaii can help to raise awareness about behavior changes people can make to protect the bees' habitat. We talk about the current administration's push to weaken the Endangered Species Act and how this is extremely problematic. We speak on how cross-discipline collaborative research can make questions and findings more accessible. We also touch a little bit on the Pattern Ecology Project, which is a collaboration Lisa is doing exploring the making of art about science, through science, and the scientific process. Since there's so much cool music that's come out of Lisa's collaborations and field work, instead of including a song this time kind of in the middle of this interview or a couple songs inside this interview, I decided that I thought it was a cool idea to do a mixtape with Lisa's work and do a separate episode and put a compilation together of songs. So you can download that episode and enjoy listening to Lisa's compositions that utilize her field recordings in the Amazon, Hawaii, and beyond. Go ahead and find that one as well after you listen to this interview. And let's go ahead and get to listening to this conversation with Lisa. Happy listening, y'all.
I find your work really interesting because you mix a lot of different mediums together. And I'm curious, you, you're you like an ecologist, technically? I have a background in technically environmental studies mm -hmm. and environmental science. I studied in undergrad as an undergrad and, and grad student, but my emphasis was on ecology and in particular entomology, so the study of insects. And so I took a lot of courses in, in ecology and entomology and ecology of insects and did was employed as an ecologist and field biologist here and there after I finished grad school. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then you are a musician, a composer, and like, I guess, more of a percussionist than a musician? Yeah. I've always been a performer on the drums and percussion, well, since I was like nine. But then in the last decade, I've become more of a composer, too. So, cool. Yeah. So yeah. what inspired you to combine those two things together? Um, I felt like whenever, whenever I was um, doing field biology, I really missed doing music and vice versa. So like whenever I was on tour with my band, I was like, ah, I want to be in the woods. And um, so I was like, there must be a way to combine these. I couldn't figure it out for a long time. And then I was um, doing my master's thesis and I spent a lot of time like listening, even though I was supposed to be like surveying ants, which I, I was <laughs> doing, but I spent a lot of time listening to sound and like writing down what I was hearing. Um, it in musical notation in my field notebook. And so, um, and then it was, so I started thinking about like, oh, maybe I could write music based on what I hear. Um, and I started getting interested in acoustic ecology and soundscape ecology, or I should say I had been already reading that since I was an undergrad and like was really curious about it. So I had all these like things in my mind and I was figuring out how to combine them. And actually at a signal fire residency is where it all like kind of coalesced. And it was the Signal Fire Outpost Residency. And I did it in like, I think it was 2010. Um, and I built a drum set out of found objects using some just some stands that I brought. And I um, listened because it was like the most free time and alone time I'd had maybe ever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just sat and listened a lot and wrote down ideas and wrote some compositions based on what I was hearing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's where it all like kind of started, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Signal Fire is so interdisciplinary in that way too. Like, we're just mixing a lot of things together, and it really makes seems to make sense, or at least I almost give permission to other people mm -hmm. to put things together in ways they that seem like they don't go together or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I always pictured that composing from nature would be like cheesy or like kind of um, gimmicky. Or like too contrived or something, and 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 then when I actually was doing it, I was like, no wait, this is like, how is this any cheesier than listening to music for inspiration? Like listen to another band for inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like why is listening to nature like silly? You know, it's like no, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just as valid. So, yeah. But yeah. How do you feel like? So you've done a lot of different projects now that you've done a lot. I mean, I was just like looked over before we met up like some of the stuff you've been doing and I'm like wow this thing is really cool and this is a whole other project that's really <laughs> cool and this thing um what is the I mean it seems like that people have been responding to some of the projects that you have been doing combining those two things so maybe mm -hmm. you could speak a little I mean there's a few different things but I guess what do you feel like people respond to in that process of of combining the research and the sound together. For example, you did a project on the ants in Brazil, tropical ants. Yeah, and still working on that. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. or you it's an ongoing project. Yeah. And the work that's coming out of that, how are people responding to that? Like how is it I mean, how, at least from what you can see, like how is it making how is it making people feel or like respond yeah. to the issue at hand? Um the most common response is like whoa I didn't know that ants made sound you know not so that you know and then they're like oh this is like and then they 
might say that they like the music too, but the initial, most common response is that they didn't know that the ants made sound and they're like really surprised. And that was my goal. Well, one of my goals. And then um, the other, I actually asked people, been asking people as part of the work, like how it makes them feel. Um, and I have some plans for future versions of the work that will ask that even more deeply and more broadly and then collect that information. But um, I have like all these slips of paper because I have an audio video version of the work that's been installed like four or five times now. And um, it's a like iPad with a video and there's text from different science texts that I quote like from different like soundscape ecologists and biologists and then there's text that I wrote and it, you listen to the music while you're reading it and it's like a 16 minute loop um most people only stand there for a few minutes but there's um a table or a shelf with pieces of paper with questions on it like how does this make you feel and did you know that ants make sound and you know, how does, how does your everyday life relate to the ants of the New World tropics and questions like that? Um, so I've actually been collecting a lot of responses. And people, like, mostly, like, have really playful responses. Like, I love the ants. Like, I want to be able to see into their world and, like, or they say funny things and, yeah, mm -hmm. playful stuff. Yeah. So it's like bringing to light this part of the ecology, this tiny little bit of it that we almost don't even look at that mm -hmm. they've been here so long and they yeah. play such an integral role yeah 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 that's the whole idea is to like have people like like question reality like whoa wait you know we you know it's not everything is not as we see it and um a lot of the what i wish people would sort of see um what i want people to see and i know i can't determine what people are see can see and i know that there can be many responses that are positive but the thing there's this narrative that really gets to me in the media and popular culture now that like we have to like go like um colonize other planets because we fucked up this one and it makes me so mad every time i hear that i'm just like Ah, and it, and the, any interest that I might have in what another planet is like is just like overcome by this anger that like there's a sense of giving having given up on this planet um and I I feel like there's a certain amount of arrogance arrogance that one has to have to even assume that we could even manage to colonize another planet because I'm trying to point out through this work that we don't even know like how this planet works like you don't even know that ants talk. Like, you don't know what these ants are doing. How could you, like, assume that we can replicate the conditions for life on another planet? Like, we can't. Mm -hmm. Or, like, have fun going to try. <laughs> it's like, we should, like, take care of this planet instead. Instead of changing how we exist. Yeah. Let's just go take the same thing and destroy some other place. Yeah, and so I'm just like, what? Hey, look, like, we don't even know what's going on here. And that's okay, but we have to like respect it and just focus on what's going on here. Like, how did you get started on that? Like I'm blown. I'm like, wow. How do you just sudden like suddenly you're recording ant sounds? Oh, in the jungle? like how does that happen? It's like a well, when I was doing environmental studies work in graduate school, um, I worked with a professor um, named Jack Longino, and he's one of the like experts of ants and the new world tropics and i worked in his lab for the whole time i was in school and i studied ant taxonomy with him and ant species richness so i was already interested in ants before i even started working with him i became interested in them when i was an undergrad and i took an animal behavior class and decided to study the ants that were in the nature preserve on campus. I just always thought they were super cool and interesting and that they were like, had all these like weird secrets going on that I wanted <laughs> to figure out. So yeah, so I've always had an interest in them. And, and then like, it was like seven years ago and my bandmate Alan and I were doing field recording in Joshua Tree and we were getting really experimental in trying to find sounds because it was really quiet 
and it is quiet in the Mojave Desert. And so we took like a flat contact mic I have. And a contact mic is just a microphone that picks up vibrations. And I think it was his idea, actually. And we saw ants, and he's like, let's put it under the ants. And so we like slid it on the, under the sands, like where the ants were walking into their nest. And we thought we would record footsteps, but um, we ended up getting like these weird, like almost like, vocal vocalizations and we were like totally freaked out we're like that's not real that's just like an artifact of a microphone has to be like what is going on because it was kind of like but like super super faint but like we're musicians and our ears are trained and so we we listened to it a bunch of times like no 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 no, that's actually there and um and i sent it to a couple of entomologists and no one responded to me and then I just kind of like got busy and forgot about it. And then <laughs> um, and then I applied for this program called Lab Verde in Brazil. And um, it's an art immersion in the Amazon. And I was sitting there thinking about what I should propose. And they have um, one of the scientists they work with is, an, is a myrmecologist, which is someone who studies ants. It's a specific kind of entomologist. And so I was like, oh my God, I should like look into that weird like ant making, ants making sound thing that mm-hmm. we were thinking about whatever, five years ago. And so I was like, I want to record the sound of ants in the Amazon. <laughs> That's my proposal. And I wrote to him, Fabricio, the entomologist in Brazil. And he was like, what? Ants make sound? Like he'd studies ants and he didn't know. Right, because they probably aren't don't have the equipment, aren't thinking about... Yeah, and because most ant communication is... The emphasis is on chemical communication. So we started a partnership, and that's why I'm still continuing the work there. So Fabricio and I... And now we have a team of, like, five people who are doing this. So that's how it happened. Um, Yeah. So you're studying the sounds, and you've been making music with the sounds, too. Yeah. And we have a team, so Fabricio is kind of like the advisor. He's the professor. And also, like, he does PR for the project. And he just, like, well, guides the project because he's the, the um, professional myrmecologist. And then um, there's me, and I know a lot about ants, and I do most of the field recording, and then I do the music composition and the public presentation of that. And then Erica is an undergrad and about to be graduate student, and she does the analysis of the sound. So she like makes all the charts and the data analysis. And um, then this woman, Tainara, is a primatologist who studies sound in monkeys, and she's advising Erica on her analysis. So we have like, and all of us go out in the, and then Anthony is on the team too, my boyfriend, Anthony Brisson, and he's like our tech advisor slash field assistant and he goes out in the field with us too and he's really good at um working equipment and stuff and like figuring out solutions for recording yeah Mm -hmm. so that's our team is there anything you've been able to discover or figure out like about I don't know I mean it seems like this is a new territory in that yeah and the funny thing is at first like Fabricio was like what ants make sound and then we started researching it and we found hardly any papers um, in the literature about ants making sound. And then we were able to find a few more here and there and there was more than we thought there was initially, but still compared to chemical communication is hardly at all any. And most of the emphasis is on just a few species. So like we've already discovered information that is new to science. Like um, And this last trip where we just went, I think we recorded ants in like three different genus genuses genera that um make sound that haven't been at least no one's published you know and we're doing comparisons between species and between higher taxa that no one's done before so they all make slightly different sounds yeah and there's like different frequency and different rhythms and the mechanism which they make the sound with is different between different kinds of ants yeah and then the size of the ant will determine what it's like to you. Yeah. So there's like a lot of questions that we can ask and answer. And we're just in the beginning of it. Ants yeah. are some of the old, like they've been around a really long time. Yeah. Yeah, and there's like some more primitive ants. And then there's some more highly evolved ants. 
Um, yeah, there's so many kinds of ants, especially in the tropics. So the piece that we featured in a podcast episode where I interviewed someone on the island of Kauai, mm-hmm. um, we used one of your pieces that yeah. you made while you studied bees. So that was called the what? Hylaeus Hylaeus project? Hylaeus project, yeah. yeah. So maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Because that was, yeah. I, wouldn't, I had read about that project of yours because you had emailed me saying, hey, I have music if you want to include it in the podcast. And then I looked at your that project and then I when I was in Kauai I was like looking for bees I was like wonder what else see I don't know is that the one like yeah is that the endemic bee like <laughs> oh cool yeah did you see any I did actually on the beach I went to that plant that's likes to be right on the it's like a tree that likes to be right on the shore no, no pop up is that the half flower, like the half moon no, white flower? I know that one because I know that there's like a whole story about that yeah. one too. Um, or, and like in, there's a different one that grows up high, but it was yeah. a different tree. Um, there's also... Heliotrope? Not yeah, heliotrope. That. They visit heliotrope. Oh. But there's also introduced bees that look like them that visit heliotrope. So it's, sometimes I have a hard time telling. Tell me a little bit about that project because that yeah. was really fascinating to learn about. Yeah, that project, the Hylaeus project, similarly came out of um, biology work that I did. So, um, and I was, I worked in Hawaii a long time ago, like 12 years ago, as an entomology intern on ant stuff, actually. But, and then later on, I um, worked for the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation here in Portland. And they knew I was interested in Hawaii anything and anything having to do with the tropics and that was my passion so um they gave me an assignment to like look at the genus of Hylaeus in Hawaii and try and make suggestions as to what would be the best bees to list as endangered species um and so I was in touch with this scientist Carl Magnaca for like six months and I drafted the original petitions to list six or seven, seven, seven species of Hylaeus is endangered. And using Carl's information and um, some historical information, um, we like put together these petitions with all the information about their habitat and where they used to be, where they currently are, all these things. And Carl um, had studied them in the 90s and there had been like a hundred year gap in between when Carl studied them and the previous person that studied them and the previous person that studied them was like some natural historian from Britain who was like running around the islands like shooting down birds like kind of you know that style that they used to do in the 1800s (laughs) um well they still do that actually but that's besides the (laughs) but his name was Perkins and so like nobody looked at these bees for a hundred years and then Carl looked at them and they had declined like significantly and so then I found myself working on these petitions and talking to Carl every day. And um, I left that job when they ran, ran out of funding. We had submitted the petitions and I started applying for grants to do like an art project on the bees. Cause I realized that I was one of the few people in the whole world that like had paid any attention to these bees because I called around and no, everyone was like, Hi, is who, you know, nobody, even in Hawaii, no one had any records. And so um, I eventually, it took a few years, but we got funding and I brought my friend Aiden Koch, who's an illustrator, to Hawaii and we went to three islands and she illustrated the book and we together wrote the text and there was a chapter on each site that we visited. And um, then we did a lot of field recording and I composed largely on site, like at, in the field, I composed these pieces based on the habitats. So it wasn't, they weren't based on the sounds of the bees because the bees are so small and I can hear hear them. Um, and they're so rare, so it was hard to even find any. Um, but I based it on their habitats, the soundscapes of their habitats. A few years after we did that project, not necessarily because of our project, but just because people, people like really pushed through these petitions and probably the experts in Hawaii like told the Fish and Wildlife Service that they should be listed and they were listed on October 31st, 2016, which was like right before Trump was elected. 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so they're still protected, but Trump, like, this week, um, like, it's, like, weakening the ESA. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I this week they, they, they um, I don't know if they passed these changes, and I know they're being challenged in court by multiple nonprofit organizations, but um, they're trying, one of the changes would be that if the species is declared threatened and not endangered, it won't get any protection, which is, like, terrible and then another change is that unless the species is threatened in its entire range of habitat it will not get any protection so That's but weird. in the case of these bees all of their habitat is threatened but this seems like they're just trying to weaken it as much so this, as possible. a new pipeline can be put through without any plans. yeah it's like oh if they still have habitat over here we can build the pipeline over here even though, like, wait, it needs all this habitat because it's endangered <laughs> yeah and um they also like said that now they can consider economic um, impacts before deciding to list the species. Whereas before that was, there was like, that was not considered. It was like, well, if the species is going to go extinct, if we don't change our behavior, then we have to change our behavior. It wasn't like, well, we're going to save money if we let it go extinct. But now, so it's like basically making the ESA like um, totally ineffective if they, Pass these changes without they didn't like cancel the bill, but they basically canceled the bill. Yeah. So um, that was just this week. Oh, I was just reading about. I think it was a conservative president that originally passed that, which is yeah. really interesting. Because it's like really sensible legislation. It's not like radical. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. But right now in our times, for whatever reason, this. Yeah president doesn't think so (laughs) oh i don't even think he understands it i think he's just like basically if someone like kisses his butt and wants to get rid of the esa and they're nice to him he's like sure Sure. throw me some dollars all right yeah yeah i don't think he's smart enough to even understand what it means but in the case of these bees in hawaii it's important too that they get put on this list because of any development future development that could happen there. I know when I traveled there, I was so shocked at how many endemic plants there were too, mm-hmm. and how complicated that whole yeah thing is. And like you know these little islands, like how do you even build new things at this point with yeah. so much fragility in that way? Yeah, and citizen science is like really important in Hawaii, or I got that impression. And it's people, and and there's a lot of potential for it to grow because people just, when I've gone to Hawaii and I've gone like four or five times, people just seem very like conscious of their environment. Maybe it's because they're on an island or maybe it's just because they're conscious and they're conscious of like the species and plants around them and what's going on and environmental issues, regardless of what side they might stand on. And I feel like there's, like, all this potential to, like, educate people about these bees and what the bees need. Because I've talked to the biologists who are now working on the bees because now there's, like, a few people who've dedicated their studies to these bees since they got listed. Um, And there's a public outreach program going on. And a lot of it has to do with just, like, people knowing that when you camp on such and such beach, like, don't break twigs off of the plants. Bring in your firewood. Because you might be snapping a twig off a plant and it might be like one third of the remaining population of this bee on that beach that you just destroyed and burned in your fire. Um, And like things like that. And then like um, also the heliotrope, like um, if people know that that's important for the bees, then they won't remove it. It's a non-native species. So some people are like, oh, let's take that out and plant native Hawaiian species. But it's actually the one one non-native species that those bees use. So, like, having people know that they should leave it in place is important. And so, like, a lot of it is, like, restricting development, too, of course. Um, Not letting someone build in the middle of a habitat, but a lot of it's just, like, behavior-based stuff. Having that awareness then can can inform, like, how you landscape or... Yeah. Yeah, things like that. Mm -hmm. I was working at the Kauai Food Forest, and I... While I was there, and I asked a couple people... Who were, who were kind of headlining it about mm-hmm. the bees and they didn't really know anything about it. Yeah. Which is interesting. People don't know. 
And there is potential to reintroduce them into their old habitat sometimes in some places. Yeah. Hmm. I guess, and they're probably really sensitive because there, there's been a lot of monocropping and a lot mm-hmm. of those plants that they liked are not are yeah. rare too. Yeah, because they like depend almost exclusively on the native plants. Um, and they don't want to go to like some of the introduced plants. Just the heliotrope. Just just that one. But, Pretty much huh. just that one. I think there was like a couple instances of other plants, but that's the only one that they're really consistently seeing oh. on. Yeah. For some reason they like it, which is good because if they didn't like it, they'd be in trouble. <laughs> <'Cause> right. They, <laughs> Yeah, and then even if there are native plants present in the habitat, it's possible that the ants won't be there because, not the ants, the bees. <laughs> it's possible that the bees won't be there because if there are ants present, there's like aggressive ant species that are, have oh. invaded Hawaii, um, then they, the bees can't deal. And the they bees attack just like, the bees? Yeah, and they like um, are present in the flowers that the bees visit. So, and there was an introduced ant. Yeah, there's no ants that are native to Hawaii. Hawaii has zero native ant species. Actually, Hawaii has zero social native social insects. So no like social wasps, no native honeybees, nothing like that. The only native bees are the hylaeus. And um, so and there are many ants that have been introduced to Hawaii. Uh, uh, most of them are fine. They established populations and they're just doing their thing and they're not bothering anybody but a few ant species have just like had population explosions because they have no natural predators and they've like really harmed native insects in hawaii yeah so so the they're harming the bees yeah but i like actually one of my songs um that I wrote is called Pepe Pepeo Cabin and it's based on a place in the national park in Volcanoes National Park and it's kind of based on the movement of the ants that were there. This like frantic movement of the ants inspired mm-hmm. a lot of the parts in that song. Mm-hmm. There was like so many ants. If you like went outside the cabin you would just had ants crawling on you. Do they bite and stuff too? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that bad, but they bite a little bit. Wow. And that project too you did I'm always thinking about how you can kind of get at an idea or like express the impression of something in different mediums. Mm -hmm. And you did like nature writing and stuff like that too, right? Photography, the drawing, your friend was doing the drawing. Yeah, the photography, the photography we used mainly in like our presentations of the work, which I still do. I still give talks about that project. But drawing and watercolors, that's what Aiden did. And then Aiden also did a lot of writing. And I did a lot of writing. And so we have a book. I have a copy of it here. I'll show you it. Yeah, I would love to it's see like, it in real life. Yeah, it's like 260 pages. So it's like wow. a bit small. And, um, and then we did music. And originally I released the music on a cassette. And there were like four songs. And then I've since written more songs from the project. Three of them were on our previous album. album and I think three of them are going to be on this upcoming album that we're releasing this year. So, yeah, kind of ongoing. Mm-hmm. So Secret Drum Band is like your own project or it's a collaborative project with people who aren't necessarily involved with the research. Secret Drum Band is my band that I started and I established it um, basically as an outlet to play these pieces that I compose based on soundscapes and nature. But it's evolved into a collaborative project with Alan Wilson, and we do, co- we can co-compose, and sometimes, well, we co-compose part of the time. Sometimes he composes, sometimes I compose, and so like, the songs go through different processes before they get finished. Like one song that we're working on now is actually from my original Hawaii field work, and I composed it, and we used to perform it in one form, and then at some point we decided we didn't (laughs) like it anymore, and then I gave it to him. And he put it through his process and changed it, and then it came back to me, and then I edited it again. And then we put the old field recordings back in. Um, And now we have a new song, a new version of the song. So um, sometimes that happens, but it is the main band that plays these pieces. And most, I'd say like 80, 90% of the song Secret Drum Band performs are from my field work. Mm -hmm. 
um, and Alan's fieldwork and the fieldwork we did together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that that it takes on a new form in this way. You bring it into the world too to share it and like how it evolves in that way. Mm-hmm. It's really, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, and I've kind of Alan's gotten into this like field recording, and we've done a lot of that together too. Yeah. And then I also do field recording um, in on my own to produce works that are, I'm not sure what I'm releasing them under, but they might just be like Lisa Schoenberg, and I've been playing around with this name, WOW, or U-A-U, which is basically WOW in Portuguese. Mm-hmm. I've been playing around with that as maybe the name of my like solo work that isn't Secret Drum Band. That's similar, so, like, using sounds from the land. Yeah, and percussion ways. and electronic instruments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Cool. And Secret Drum Band plays shows in different places to mm-hmm. of this of these pieces. And then is there an educational element when you play, or is it usually just performing? I, and It depends. Like, we play shows in clubs sometimes, and... I'll always, unless we're really short in time, I'll always try and talk about the context of the songs in between songs. So I'll be like, this one I wrote, you know, in the Amazon, it features the sounds of ants. Something really short. Um, like that, like talk for one minute. Um, but then I also offer lectures when the venues seem appropriate, like in galleries and universities and museums and stuff like that. So like about... A third of the shows that we did on this last tour also had like a lecture before That's or cool. after or maybe in the afternoon the same day. Or um, I also did some workshops in field recording and, and music composition from soundscapes. So I did a couple of workshops. Yeah, so there's definitely like educational component. And my friend Christina Dutton and I have organized a couple of events where there was like a panel discussion of artists and scientists talking together. Do you feel like um, the intersections of science and music is a, a, a joint effort that's sort of becoming more utilized, more popular, more like sought after in the academic world? I don't know. Because, I mean, I'm aware of, like, some of the history of the practice Mm -hmm. through reading and finding, learning about it. Like, classical composers who composed from nature sound and people who, like, I feel like in the, a long time ago, people used to not focus as, in such a limited way like they do now like you know if someone's a biologist they're a biologist whereas it used to be like it was more common for someone to be a biologist and play the piano and pursue both of them just as much um but and it's also hard to tell if there's more interest now because there's more access to information now like we have everybody's instagram profile and everyone has a website and so we know more about what everyone's doing so it's hard to say if there's more interest can share individually to not necessarily through an academic institution. Yeah. Yeah. On your own, which is how I, I don't have an academic affiliation now. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I notice it a lot because I'm attracted to that. I, I see it out in the world. If I see like art in ecology or music in ecology, I'm like, what? And you know, I pay attention to it. So it seems like there's a lot of interest. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like those kinds of, like, breaking apart the compartmentalization is becoming more important, too, Mm -hmm. these days, to really see things in different ways. Mm -hmm. Again, like we were saying about Signal Fire being a really interesting organization that kind of puts together, or, like, allows the space to put together things that, Mm -hmm. you know, don't necessarily seem like they usually go together, you know? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I think it's really important. Um, I think it's really important right now, too, because there's so much the government is, like, um, attacking science so much um, and devaluing it. And at the same time, they're devaluing art and creative expression. 
And so like, I think it's even more important for scientists and artists to come together to like strengthen each other's efforts and like, you know, um, give strength to each other's arguments and each other's work and create work together. So it's even more effective. So it's something signal fire does. I think Ryan told me, I don't know what it's called where they help get musicians into non environmental nonprofits. Yeah. I think it's like all kinds of artists. Cause I know a guy who did it in the bark office. This guy, Gary did it a few years ago. And so like they have a residency in a nonprofit. Yeah. And they can respond to whatever work they're doing. Maybe the nonprofit has some agenda, but they also just let the artists like, respond and then yeah. they make something they can use to communicate about their yeah i think a musician did it in the gorge and an organization in the gorge what's his name i can't remember his name but this other guy did it yeah yeah they're doing that it's really awesome yeah instead of it being we're brand, we're gonna have someone come brand it's like no actually or someone just like make this really specific mm-hmm. thing like have someone who has that ear or that eye yeah or that like um yeah some other perspective yeah and fabricio the entomologist that i'm working with in the amazon he's super cool and i'm so glad i found him and he used he used to be in a touring band (laughs) and now he's a zoologist and entomologist and he really recognizes the value in our collaboration because he sees and he knows like how many people musicians can reach and how few people a myrmecology paper can reach like how many people are going to read the next paper about like this ants? Probably like just the people who are researching ants. Maybe some of the people who are researching beetles. It's like just you know, in a library locked away somewhere. Yeah, and a, and a, in, inaccessible to the common yeah. Half people. the time you have to pay it and read it anyways. It's ridiculous. And you can't even go to the conference without paying like six hundred dollars. So it's like you know it makes so much sense to research these things together. Um, and to come up with the questions together, not only to like, like you're saying, like do some like interpretive poster and like do the design, but to actually like come up with the questions together and to do the research together, reach us more people. But, yeah. Do you have, um, so the Brazilian ant project is ongoing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And that bee project in Hawaii is, is that ongoing as well? It could be. I never like ended it or anything. Yeah. It's just that um the Amazon thing started happening. Um and I have like active collaborators there in Brazil and a really good infrastructure for doing the work and super excited to be there. So I've kind of been putting my energy into that. Um the funding comes from grants and there are they more or other it's, places? Or? Um, I've gotten some support from the Lab Verde program in Brazil yeah. that I originally did the residency with, and they're still involved in our, my work, and I work for the Lab Verde program too, so that's helped me be able to go down there. So I work for them when I go down there too. I'm always curious like how that, especially when there's not a clean line, like, like you have grants that go for a specific thing. Yeah, a specific project. And like... How to, you know, when they can mm. combine different things together. Like how... Yeah, and also, like, I do licensing, music licensing work. So I use my income from that to be able to do these projects. And I cool. teach drums. So I've, I've gotten a lot of grants in the past, but I actually haven't gotten any super recently. Um, and it's just cheaper to live. For an American like me to go down to Brazil is, is easier than, than coming here. So... And it's easier for me to pay for things there than it is for me to pay things here. You know, so it's actually like, it's just getting there. That's the yeah. problem. Yeah. Can I talk about one yeah, other project? Yeah, yeah. Um, I did a residency at the H.J. Andrews Biological Station last year. And it's a forest research station near Eugene in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And um, it's where a lot of like the most important research about old growth forests has taken place in Oregon. And it's where they like kind of came up with the research to even define the concept of old growth forest. And they did a lot of the foundational research about spotted owl, which was then used to like listed and, you know, really was like kind of central to forest conservation efforts in the Northwest. 
And all the scientists there, the biologists there are super cool and still doing like really awesome work. And it's a long-term ecological research station. So the work is a lot of the projects are planned for a 200 year span. Wow. So they really want to get a broad picture. And so I did a residency there and I went out in the field with some biologists, stream ecologists and a spotted owl biologist and um, wrote music based on my recordings and experiences there. And um, I'm working on that right now too. And that'll be, that'll come out soon ish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing we can online. There is something online. online. I, yeah. I released one song so far. It's an electronic piece that consists only of field recordings and it's on my website. It's okay. called um, Lookout Creek Eighth Notes. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's from stream sampling. And, and it's based on a piece by a visual artist named Leah Wilson. And she did a visual piece where she put a stone in the stream right near the stream monitoring station and um, took a photo of it. I forget how often, like every minute or every 10 minutes, and then digitally rendered the colors in that photo. And then from the digital categorization of the colors actually made a painting of one square for every sample and and then has this like grid of squares of like the color throughout time from all of her sampling wow. yeah and it's beautiful and so this biologist or geomorphologist specifically fred swanson he was like you should make a music piece based on leah's piece and i said that's a really good idea and so i like <laughs> went to the relatively like same spot that she went to and took sound samples with a hydrophone in the stream and built a piece using my own method, but based on her work. Um, and in the same way that she did, both of our works kind of like take like this, like kind of seemingly indecipherable stream of information, whether we're like visual or audio, and then like kind of make it more tangible by like repeating and isolating information so like it seems that that would make it more digestible or more like if you're trying to communicate it to anyone who maybe should mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about that ecology mm -hmm. that that would like be more something people will respond to than just all the data and the yeah. numbers and stuff it's kind of more fun Fun. <laughs> to listen to look at art or listen to music yeah. than to read data right or maybe not for all people yeah, it's got me <laughs> thinking like what are there's so many ways that that could be done too yeah you know mm -hmm. taking lists of this this and this they're in place and you know measuring all these things and like how can all those patterns be used in yeah creative ways to communicate that work yeah that's what i'm really interested in doing stuff like that and that's kind of what i'm doing with the ant songs too mm -hmm. yeah. is there anything that your work that's some other future stuff that you're thinking about and um i'm going to panama on friday with my friend christina dutton and we have a new-ish collaboration called pattern ecology and we met through um a project she was doing and found we had common interests and she's a violinist and composer and um so our project um is basically an exploration of making art about science and through science and making and documenting scientific process but also like asking questions about science and art to scientists and artists so it's like interviews and video she does the video mm -hmm. stuff and music composition. And um, so we're going to Panama to be part of this conference called Dynacon. Um, it's a month long meeting of biologists, artists, and hackers. And we're gonna be there like eight or nine days in Gamboa, Panama. I'm not sure what What's gonna happen? we're gonna, yeah, we'll find out when we get there and make new stuff. So yeah. it's a really short time to like make something something and finish something but that's the rule of the conference is you have to show up stay for at least four days start something get it reviewed by two people there and finish it and present it sometimes that's that cool. pressure is a good thing and it really yeah 
puts you on it, you know. Yeah, I think it would be really cool. Um, I'm really excited to go there. Well, how can uh, folks find some of these projects to look at or listen to or read or like how what's the best way to access um i have a website it's lisa schoenberg.com um or secret drumband.com and then um on social media there's like at secret drum band at lisa lisa ann schoenberg or lisa schoenberg try both of those <laughs> I'm like, did I change it again? It's Lisa Ann. Lisa Ann Schoenberg. We'll link it in the show notes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. And then I Pattern Ecology. Yeah, at too. Pattern Ecology, yeah. and then at Ada, which I didn't mention yet, but that's the new name for our ant project. We came up with it. We were like, we were decided we need a name, and there's acronyms for so many things in Brazil. We we're like, we should do an acronym. And so it's ADA, which is Amplifying the Tropical Ants. Well, oh. thanks for all this cool stuff you do and sharing it with me today. <laughs> thanks for it's asking really me cool. about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck in Panama doing your project. Thank there. you. And I'm curious to see what comes out of that. This episode of the Ground Shots podcast was produced by Opia Creative. Our music is by Mother Marrow. If you'd like to help us continue to make this audio project a reality, consider becoming a monthly supporter on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash obsessionsalt, where we have rewards like entry into patron-only giveaways, additional audio interviews, extra educational content, and much more. You can also share our work and give us a review on iTunes. Visit our website at obsessionsalt.com. To see what else we're up to and a log of our episodes when they come out. Check out our show notes for information about how to find us and our guests. Until next time, y'all. Thanks for listening.